Investigators searching for Malaysian Flight 370 have likened it to finding a needle in a haystack. My guest knows a little something about that daunting task. Colleen Keller, a senior analyst for Metron Inc., helped locate the missing Air France flight that crashed into the Atlantic back in 2009 by using a specific mathematical model. Colleen, welcome to Evening Edition. Thank you. Now, it took two years to locate that crash site of Air France. Um, early on, it was thought the black boxes would lead to, you know, the area and would ind indicate where the plane went down. Um, why did it take two years to find that crash? It was a very unique problem. The Air France crash should have been solved in the first 30 days. They were right on top of where the debris was on the bottom of the ocean, searching with the towed pinger locators, just like they're doing now for the Malaysian aircraft. Unfortunately, as we found out later, both of the pingers on both of the black boxes were broken and weren't emitting a signal. So that entire search was actually, didn't produce any useful information. And yet we thought it did a very thorough search and we uh, recommended that they look elsewhere within the whole search area because that initial search didn't turn anything up. It was only after we went back and revisited the assumptions that perhaps the pingers weren't pinging that, the, uh, that they looked in that area again with cameras, and that's when they found the wreckage two years later. Okay, the, the, we have a map that was generated for that Air France search. Um, let's take a look at it and, and tell us what we're looking at. So these are probability maps that are generated using the Bayesian search approach that we use. It's using mathematics to kind of consolidate all the information you have into a set of probabilities broken out by squares in your search area. Each grid square is given a weight, basically, that says whether or not all the information points to the target being there or not being there. And you can see in these squares there's hot areas and cold areas within the circle. The hot areas indicate areas of high probability and it's clustered. So that red right in the middle. Right, and it's clustered around the center, which is the last known point of the aircraft. Now, you talked about using the Bayes mathematical model to gather the data that led to finding the uh, Air France plane and that, that we saw on this map here. Using that same model, what kind of data needs to be collected to locate uh, Flight 370? Well, uh, it's really everything that they have. So it's hypotheses of what happened to the plane. It's the radar data that produced the last known point and then the direction of flight when it went off radar. It's information about the endurance of the aircraft, how far it would fly before it ran out of fuel. Uh, and then any, if we had found any wreckage on the surface of the ocean, we would drift that back and use that information as well. Basically, you don't turn anything away. You use everything you can, even if it's sometimes conflicting information that doesn't make sense. Like what would be conflicting? Like the, where, it's, where they thought it was going to, whether it was uh, a mechanical problem or a theory of a mechanical problem versus a theory of a, a security or a fire problem. Well, you remember early on there were theories that the aircraft was headed to Pakistan, you know, and that it was a hijacking or something like that. We didn't find any data to disprove that, but we didn't find data to lend credence to that. So it's a theory that's still on the table, but it's much less likelihood than the maintenance failure theory that we're pursuing now. So you take the facts, that's one layer, but I understand it's sort of, it's more dimensional than that. You also have to take sort of some uh, precedents or these ideas that maybe might not be as tangible as the ocean currents or, uh, you know, the, the amount of fuel that could be spent. Well, the concept of a hijacking implies that they're taking the airplane somewhere to land it safely and then either ransom the people or maybe reuse the plane. So the logical thing there would be to search for all places where the aircraft could have landed. So the, there would be high probability supporting that theory in any uh, air, airplane airport that's long enough to uh, accommodate the plane. So you sort of layer that data in order to maybe get what's most probable? Yeah, and so you might have little areas of probability at each of the big international airports, and then you might go look for the plane there and you don't see it, and then that probability goes away because you've eliminated that theory. Right, knowing now that it, in this case with the Malaysian flight, we're hearing pings from the black boxes, uh, how helpful will that be in actually locating the not only the black boxes, but the, the wreckage? Oh gosh, the pings are the holy grail in this thing. I mean, if we didn't have the pings, we'd be back to searching the, uh, what the air search is doing this, you know, hundreds of thousands of square miles. The pings have been localized into maybe a 20 square mile area, and they're trying to get it down even further. That'll allow us to use the very precise sensors on the unmanned underwater vehicles, the side scan sonar, and the cameras to really get in and find the wreckage. How long do you think it'll take? Do you think it'll be soon? We're hoping they'll get uh, a Bluefin 21, which is the submersible, into the water maybe within a week, for sure after the pings are done. And then after that, it could take several months, but we could get lucky and do it, find it right off the bat. All right, Colleen Keller, thank you so much. Thank you.